All right, maybe we should get started. Yep, it's around four o'clock. So thanks everyone for coming today. So welcome to lecture four of CS545. Um, it, it, it doesn't say lecture four here because we have to finish up a few things from lecture three. And then today is a bit unusual in that we'll have like a Python or a ROS tutorial. Um, most of you, it'll be a Roth tutorial, but um, if you need a Python refresher, we will also have that. And then we'll have the real topic for lecture four, which is on a Bayesian networks. Um, so some logistical questions, so, or logistical things. So homework one was due last night. So I saw a bunch of assignments on submitted on Gradescope. You can submit today or tomorrow. You have a late day budget, but I recommend not using all of it on homework one because you have the lab and the other homework. So just um, keep that in mind. And for lab one, we are going to make lab one due February 4th. So that's in roughly two weeks from now. So I, I extended it by two days because I, I thought people still didn't get D clearance until like today for some of you. So again, I don't think the lab should take two weeks. It's just that you need probably need that much time to get your team together and then install things and so on. So, uh, so yeah, we'll make the lab due February 4th. I've updated the class website and then that's where you can always get the latest uh, up-to-date uh, deadline. Uh, any logistical thing before we move on to finishing up this and then the tutorial and then lecture four? Uh, and I do have my Google Doc open to track stuff. Um, if you're on Zoom, please don't use that because like I, it's gonna be hard for me to track different um, sources of information. So just um, just raise your hand normally or just use the document link. All right, so the maximum number of people you can have, um, I would, Let's do four for now. So you can have groups of three or four. If it turns out that we can't get the team to work out, then the, the TA and I will look into the team and then just try to resolve things. So if you, know, if you I, let, let's just say that four is the maximum. So yeah, and, and if you find your team, please put it on Piazza so that the TA and I can track who's on whose team. Yeah, I think only two people responded on Piazza, so it's like two teams, and I think here there's going to be eight, nine, or ten, maybe. All right, so finishing up from last class, so remember that we talked about probability review. Uh, then we sort of left off where you know we had probability review, and uh, then we talked about the Markov assumption, uh, then we talked now we're gonna talk about you know, robots that interact with the environment and where we can analyze this by making use of the Markov assumption. So uh, just an overview of the abstraction that we consider. So we consider that a robot is gonna be at some state. So we denote that as XT. And remember the example from last class, we talked about the helicopter, the home robot and, and so on. So usually we refer, we refer to state as referring to like ground truth information or everything that is something that we need to know in order to make a decision. Now in practice, the state is incomplete. So if you have a robot that's navigating through a home, the state might be everything that's in your home, like all the objects, all, all, all their poses and so on but we really only have observational data. So we have partial information. And that's where the noisy measurements come in, like some, maybe from a camera, a tactile sensor, or uh, many other sensors 
uh, that exists. And when the robot interacts with the environment, it takes a measurement, which tends to increase the knowledge because you're taking some measurement and, and you can always ignore it. And then you have the same knowledge and then you take a new knowledge and then usually it increases it. And then when the robot takes an action, it will usually decrease knowledge of the state until we then query the sensors again to get the next updated signal. Yeah, so notation-wise, people who work in like control, they often use UT for robot action. In reinforcement learning, people often use AT. I mean, I prefer AT, but UT is also another uh, convention. So just keep that in mind. And for states, like sometimes people write ST instead of XT. So hopefully the context is clear whenever you're reading something. Yeah. And then when you take an action, you transition to a new state. And let's talk about the sensing. And here you notice that we we drawn a base network. We're gonna talk, we're gonna talk more about that later today, but Hopefully the idea here is kind of intuitive. Like you have different nodes that represent your state, the action, and then the, the sensor. And there's many ways to get to sense and get data. Just pretend that the Z just include the stuff. So the Z is just some kind of abstraction that represents the sensor and some sensor measurement. So, what does it mean to consider the Markov assumption here? And if we have this probability here, probability of ZT, the that you see and you get this measurement conditioned on all the prior variables. If we are assuming the Markov assumption represented with this base net, what do you think goes here? Uh, you can write it down here or maybe just say, uh, I'll give you 10 or 15 seconds to think about it. Anyone? Hmm. Interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, XT, XT, you, you, yeah, XT, and then nothing, nothing else. So you, you'll see why later, but basically if XT is complete and you have the Markov assumption where we're like, if you know XT, you don't need to know anything be, before that. And the way that the bait net is structured, you also don't need to know U uh, because what you have is like, if ZT has one parent, just one parent, then like, that's all you need to condition on it. And, and then you get this. So it's enough to condition on this to, to know the whole probability. All right, now about actuator. So now we're going to talk about how the robot actually affects the environment. So, you know, actuators are these things that actually not move the robot. So they're like motors that move like an arm somewhere, or they might move the wheel so that the robot goes to some place. Under the hood, everything is converted into some kind of motor torques or forces that act on the robot. So again, what does it mean to consider the Markov assumption here? Where you we are assuming that a system evolves according to this Bayesian network. So we have probability of XT conditioned on all the prior variables. So yeah, so yeah, what goes here if we're assuming the Markov assumption and the structure of the base net? I'll let you think about it for 10 seconds and then we'll yeah, we'll we'll go on.
I think the people are overlapping in the Google Doc. Like, so okay, here's what it is. So if you have XT and you're trying to compute the probability, the way that the base net is structured is that you only have to look at the, the parents of XT, which are XT minus one and UT. Yeah. So we'll see more examples of that later, this lecture and the next one. Uh, yeah. There's no C in the right hand side because do you only see a Z after you've gotten to the state? Well, yeah, yeah. So the way it works is you, the robot encounter is in state XT. And then we have a measurement that tries to get information about it. But here we wanted to know what's the probability of XT. So we don't really need, we're assuming we, we don't condition on like the, the next sensor. So. Again, the reason why this equation is true is because we're making an assumption. Like this may not be true for some environment that you might be concerned about. And if you think that's the case, then you should not use this assumption. But I'm making this assumption to make it simpler. Yeah. Yeah, so summary, again, this is really the summary of the last class plus this one. So we covered probability basics. So it's very important to know for robotics, especially as they become more probabilistic these days. And then, yeah, today we'll be covering Bayesian network. And although before that, we'll cover ROS and other practical stuff. All right, now I got to make sure that I still share the screen. Uh, okay, let's, all right, so let's remove, stop share, remove this, and uh, then we're going to share the screen. I'm going to minimize this because I want to. I want to go through this, but also have my command line here so I can type some stuff in. So I, I'm not going to maximize this. I'm just going to make the I'll scroll through it manually. And then let me share the desktop. Can I do that? Oh, desktop. Okay. Okay. And. Yeah, still recording. Yeah. Uh, so again, if you're on Zoom and you have a question, please put it in the Google Doc instead, just so I can focus on, uh, on fewer, fewer stuff. So. Hi, uh, your Python, NumPy, and ROS tutorial. And, and this is already on the course website. So if you do want to follow along, you can just click on the slide, but then you should, you should see this. Yeah, I see a whole bunch of people there now. Uh, uh, five people. Okay. Hi, Python. So here's a tutorial if you're new to Python, but I'm guessing that most of you, if not all of you, have used Python before. So, but if you are new, you can look at this. But the claim that I'll make is that even though it's meant, as, it's meant as a quick refresher, but it's not going to be enough. The best way to know how to use the programming language is to implement something with it instead of reading from a book or some website. So, so yeah, and let me pull this up here. So basic Python usage, so you... You can print some stuff, their variable, their arithmetic operators, string, list, dip, if else condition, for list, um, iterating over things, you have functions, you have classes, and then you have exceptions. So again, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I mean, maybe I can just go through a few of these. So well, hopefully, hopefully you can see this, uh, yeah. So I'm using IPython, and you can kind of, you can see that I'm in Python 3.8 shell. And then you can do things like print hello world, and then it does that. And then you have things like lists. So you can have a list be Daniel is uh, what do you want to fill in for that? What do you want to fill in here? Okay. 
Yeah, and then L is your lift, right? And then you can do things like lift a painting, you know, really? Uh, stuff like that. And then if you, like the addition to a lift is constant time when you amortize it over, you know, over longer number of items in the string. Uh, then, yeah, so I guess I don't really have to go through this. Like I'm assuming most of you already know this. So if you don't know, then just look at that tutorial and then see the example there. So good thing that that is great for prototyping. So it's often remarkably similar to pseudocode. It has a huge user base, which is very important when you're trying to find solution to simple issues like, you know, the number of stack overflow posts on Python is a lot, or you can also go on chat GPT and because it's been trained on so much Python data, it usually gives good answers, at least when I try it. It can talk to efficient libraries. So uh, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in going forward soon. And yeah, many robotics researchers use it. So I use it and many others in my lab use it as well. So some cons are that you know, it's interpreted and not compiled. So if you, you know, run Python code, you might of course get into some errors based on like a wrong type or a wrong class. And if you were programming in C or C++, you would probably, or C++, I should say, you would probably catch that uh, during the compiling stage. So this is why if you're familiar with NumPy and the deep learning library like PyTorch, what they really do is they have their real horsepower implemented in, in C or some other language like Fortran. And the Python stuff is just a way to interface with it. So you type some you know, code and then it will really call some optimized C code under the hood. Yeah. So uh, historically, and, and maybe also today, Python has had some poor concurrency support when you're trying to run multiple things in, in parallel. So if you want some more context, you can look at the Python, uh, you know, the global interpreter lock. Although there is, they are, they have voted, I think, to make it optional. Uh, I don't know when that will actually be uh, you ready yet. So you can just look at this note for, for more. Yeah, so type checking. So if you, yeah, again, you have to kind of do it manually, but they're, way that you can get around it or way that you can make your code a little more robust. So you can use linters. So linters are things that, like they're off the shelf programs that you can uh, run to check that your Python code doesn't have some obvious errors, for example. And you can also make use of assertion. So I do that a lot too. Like I have assert this thing e is of type, you know, this thing or this thing has a shape of these dimensions, if it's a NumPy or a PyTorch uh, array. Yeah, and yeah, there's some, it is weird at times, there are some fun examples here, but the general advice I have is if you find yourself writing code that could be confusing, then you're not writing code the right way, so. All right, useful tool, so whenever you're, Working with Python, I recommend using Conda or virtual environment. So you can see that I have a Conda environment here, the CS545. You see that because they're parentheses, then it, it appears before this, which is my username, then it's a either a Conda or a virtual environment. I usually use Conda, but you can also use virtual environment. There's also alternative to, to these two, but yeah. And the main reason why you want to do this is that if you have multiple projects on the same machine, you want to make sure that each project has its own like Python version that you need for the various packages. So if you have one project that needs NumPy version 1.17, and then another project that needs NumPy version 1.21, then how do you resolve that? You have content environment to keep everything isolated for one project.
Like if I deactivate this, you know, I don't even have Python here. So I have to do like conda activate CS545 and then I can get Python. Uh, yeah, and I'm aware that you can use Mamba. Yeah, Mamba is another way that you can use it. I, I didn't, I think Mamba is also less popular, but it is, yeah, it is a, an alternative that people have used. Uh, I think Mamba helps with resolving some version uh, compatibility. Like, I think it, it has the more capable, capable mechanism to, to deal with that. Uh, yeah. And yeah, this way you can avoid doing any pseudo pip install something. So like if I'm working with someone and then someone does this on my machine, the first thing I do is I, I remove them from the machine and then I have to fix my machine because this thing just, this is completely wrong. So don't do pseudo pip install something. Just make your environment and then install in there. Just, yeah. All right. Yeah, formatting style. So you can format many things in Python the same way. So like if you, you can insert extra spaces, you can even have a mix of code that uses different spacing for this function versus that. Like if you're talking about indenting code, but it's a bad idea to be inconsistent in, in your code. So Google has like a Python style guide that you can try to follow and then it'll try to make your code in this consistent pattern that makes it readable and conform to like a, a style convention. Another alternative is using stuff like, you know, black or other formatters. So this is a way of like feeding control of all your formatting code to you know, this thing like black and it'll, it'll automatically format your code for you. Like making sure that you always have your parentheses in the same spot and then the, the way that you list your function arguments, they're all consistent. Uh, the nice thing is you can even have your code on GitHub. You can insert a hook to require that all pull requests conform to like black formatting or are reformatted to it to, to minimize any variation or, or confusion based on inconsistent formatting. Yeah, then there are the Python debugger. So I assume most of you are familiar with like import PDB and then you, it lets you insert a breakpoint in the code and then you run the code, it stops there and then you can always proceed line by line and then print stuff like what is in this list or what's the shape of this array. And you, you can catch many errors that way. And if you want to, if your code is very slow, then you probably, you might want to check a Python profiler. So don't always assume that you know which part of the code is taking a long time. Like you might be very surprised. So if you want to optimize for speed, just check a profiler and then you can catch many errors that way. Like the default profiler I used to profile my code and it's caught like method that were taking that were dominating the com computation time even though I thought you know they shouldn't be and then I, I caught many bugs that way. Yeah. Oh yeah then code editors. So if you're working with Python with Python like you can do stuff like this. Uh, okay. All right, so what happened is if I, if I press the escape key with this, with Zoom here, it, it makes the floating uh, meeting control appear. All right. So you can use BIM or other lightweight editor to write your Python code and then you can always run it. But the issue with that, you know, for most people, when you're running code that has a lot of files all together, uh, most people find it much easier to use code editors that support sophisticated tools like, you know, automatic autocomplete or being able to click on some function and then immediately finding where it's defined elsewhere. 
So I personally use VS Code, others use like PyCharm or whatever. And the nice thing with VS Code is that you get a lot of nice formatting, a lot of nice you know, plugins and, or extensions. So I use like the Python, the BIM, PyLint, uh, GitLab, GitHub Copilot. Um, yeah, so I mean, one reason why I like say, the Git Lens one is if you look at, here's an example of VS Code. I'm actually using HTML here, but you can, the nice thing is you can use HTML too instead of Python. So this is actually the course website. So with extensions, I can use Vim to go through all the text here. And then for like each, for each line of code, I can, use git lens and it'll tell me like who wrote the commit for that and which commit it was. So like if I click on on this, then I can click here and it'll go straight to GitHub to see where I which commit led to that. So I find that to be very helpful when working on collaborative projects. So I know who did what when I look at the code. All right, any questions on the on the Python stuff before we move on to NumPy? Okay. All right, so let's talk about NumPy then. So yeah, this is one of the most widely used Python libraries for various reasons. It's also closely related to PyTorch and other deep learning libraries that you might have used like TensorFlow and so on. So yeah, with NumPy, it, it does a, it's quite effective when you're dealing with operators on array. So let's do some, oh, okay. So you can start a uh, Python, uh, hopefully it's big enough to read. You can import NumPy. Um, in practice, everyone does NP, so just do NP. You can do array creation, like a equals NP dot zero. And then that will be a three by three array of all zeros. You can do like one. And then you can do arithmetic operator, like a plus b, which is all one, but you can also do, you know, of course, two times B, and then you get all C and so on. And all the arrays have some kind of shape property. So you can always do A dot shape, B dot shape, and you can catch a lot of bugs that way, especially if you're doing a matrix operation or some kind of operation where they, the dimensions have to be consistent with each other. So in, in my research code, I often have a lot of assertions of the form, is this shape equal to that? So. All right. Yeah, so for copying, so you know, if you do A equals B, it doesn't copy, but you have to do NP.copy. So if you have A and B like this, and you do A equals B, then now A is all one, and B is all one. If you do, you know, if you do this, then we change B here. But A also has the three. So A and B, they point to the same like underlying data structure. So you have to do something like, like this. Yeah. And you can see all the autocomplete because like I already did these commands like last night. So I, I think my IPython stores the uh, command history for me. Yeah, and then you can do a lot of arithmetic operations. So broadcasting is pretty important. You can do sum and mean. So like if you have if you have B like this, you could do np dot mean like A, and then uh, axes equal one. So that way you only take a mean over one axis. Uh, yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. Hopefully, yeah. And then there the random. So you can do Stuff like this to generate random arrays. 
like that though, it, every single item in the array is like a random number between zero and one. Yeah, then you can do vectorization. So like, instead of like cycling through item and array sequentially, you can just do them all at once with some operation. So here's a quick example of how you might use the numpy array. So the softmax is a way of, it, it's a function basically that exponentiate everything in of a set of numbers and then normalize it. So it's X is some vector and I, I already did, I already showed how to do this here, but if X is some vector like all, all one, like this, then you can do the softmax and then it'll exponentiate everything and then normalize. If all the inputs are equal like in here, then your result is just one third for three of them because they're all equal. And then this is this is how you make a probability distribution out of this. And then the way the softmax works is that you know if one item is bigger than another, then it tends to end up getting you know further. It, it it tends to become much larger relative to the others. So if you have one one two, then the result becomes something like. 0 0.21, 0 0.21, 0 0.57, but it's still a probability distribution. And does everyone understand why we have this thing here? So we have np dot exp of x minus np dot max. Uh, does everyone know why we have why we have this max here? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, yeah, like why do we have x minus np dot max instead of just x? Yeah, so it is yeah numerical stability. I I, I kind of gave gave it away here, but uh yeah, you can so you can find more ref, more detail that with the reference that I provided. Yeah, All right. Any other questions on on numpy? Hi. Well, let's talk about Roth. Uh, yeah, so for better or worse, it's very widely used in robotics today. Most labs will use Roth for running physical robot experiments. So the way to think about it is to think that when you have a robot system, it consists of many components. So there's the algorithm that do different things, like a planning algorithm. There's sensors, like different cameras. There's actuators, like motors. And for the full robot system to operate effectively, we want them to be able to communicate. We want the different parts to be able to communicate effectively with each other. So ROS, the Robot Operating System, provides tools to facilitate the cooperation between different components of a, of a robot. So it's not a real operating system. Like it's not like Linux, which is, or Ubuntu, which is an operating system. It's meant to provide tools to make it easier to get robots to function. Uh, yeah, it is popular in the robotic community and helps to abstract away some low-level details. So again, you'll learn more about it in, when you do lab one. So hopefully lab one is going well. Uh, so the default for the lab in this class, we use Roth Kinetic with Ubuntu 16 or Roth Noetic with Ubuntu 20. So I'll, I'll <laughs> give some demos of how, to, how I use Roth here. So some terms you might want to be aware of are nodes, topics, publishers, and subscribers. So 
Let me make the figure a little bit bigger. Uh, so uh, this first figure here is an example of a robot system where the node, the like green oval, that performs some kind of computation. And the yellow boxes help to post and read messages. So you can kind of think of, say, the robot state publisher as, you know, taking stuff from the joint state topic and then propagating that forward to other topics or maybe other nodes. And you have publishers and subscribers, so those are nodes that read to a topic and read messages from a topic. So I'll give you an example. So this here is this is a code snippet from a project that I worked on a few uh, last year. And I, I have the link in the bottom if you really want to look at it. It's not meant to for you to run. Like if you try to run it, you'll run into a ton of errors, but the, the main idea is just to see the example of how I how I might use it. So I have Roth subscribers here. The text that you see here are the names of cameras. So this is an RGB camera from the Azure Connect. And this is the like the depth camera and the topic that goes that converts depth information to uh RGB, although in, in, yeah, so what it really does is, I think what it really does is it takes your depth camera and then it converts it to the same dimension as your RGB data. So the color and the depth are aligned. And that's how I often get aligned color and depth images when I work with a, a robot system. So what I have is when I, this code is run in some script and then there's a separate script that I want where I launch the camera. And so that will launch the camera. Then, then this script will try to read from the topic that the camera exposes. And then there is callbacks. So we put the function as input to the subscriber, and then it'll convert from like messages that are raw specific. And then after you call their method, you can essentially treat them like NumPy. So if you work with NumPy for images, it, it's really easy. So again, this is just an example of a Roth subscriber that I use a lot, or I, I used to use a lot. Of. All right, let's do a demonstration. Uh, oops. Let me use this. Yeah, so I have your lab one here. Uh, the commands are the same, but I, I kind of need to see. I think this is going to take up my full screen. So. so this is my virtual machine. So this is Ubuntu 20. Uh, uh, hopefully you can read the text. Uh, if, if not, you can watch the recording and then try to zoom in there. Come on. There we go. Hi. Right. So the, the, the first step is usually to run the raw score command. So it, it looks like this. So it basically starts off everything. So you have to run this or some equivalent command that does equivalent thing. So this basically gets everything started and then we get an initial process and a core service to get everything started. And you can do things like Roth node list. So, you know, in a new tab, let's do off the list. Yeah. And then you, you can do other things there. So let's try the turtle thing. I, I think you're, you're doing that for lab one and I, I'm literally following 
on the section text of your lab. So, um, little m, but you guys have you've done this right? All right, you if you if you if you're doing lab one, you should see this. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm in the right class. Uh, all right, new tab. Now we need to run this other thing to actually move the robot. Yeah, so we can use the arrow keys to move. Uh, any questions? Um, you're you're doing this for your lab. Um, so yeah, then you know, you'll see that sometimes it prints out things that might be of interest to you. Hmm. So some other command, other command could be you know, RQT graph. Uh, how do I zoom in here? Oh, come on. Oh, well, I don't know how to zoom in. It, like the, the, the command, the key, the commands are, are not the same as the command to zoom in my MacBook. So sometimes it's confusing. Uh, yeah. All right, so hopefully you're Hopefully you are, are on the way to do this, are on the way to doing this if you haven't done this already. Uh, and you can only watch the recording to confirm that you've gotten the same pop-up. Uh, So yeah, for lab one, you're mostly just getting used to Roth. You will use Packin to create and install Roth packages, but keep in mind that you know, usually the directory in documentation is called Packin underscore WF, but in the VM that we gave you for Roth Noetic, it's Roth underscore WF, but as long as you're consistent with the directory then able to convert the documentation as needed, you should be okay. Yeah, then you're using turtle sim. I mean, I just showed you how to use it, so hopefully it's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, and then some other things you might want to be aware of Roth services, so those could be usually meant for one-time call that end quickly. So not for like continuous data stream, but if you need like one thing quickly to, you can use raw services. Um, so the other two things are not really raw specific. You can use them in other cases when, you, when you're not using raw. So your DF is a universal file format that describes the geometry of a robot. So if you want, to have a new robot, you usually need a URDF from like the maintainer or whatever, then you plug it in and then you import this URDF file to load in the robot. Now for robot simulator, we really like to have robot simulators that are good and accurate because we can test things in simulation and safe and it doesn't run the risk of like hardware damage or damaging people or other things in the real world. So Gazebo is one example of a simulator. So Gazebo, I think, is a pretty old simulator. It was it's good for things like basic mobility and navigation, but other simulators have appeared in recent years that are really good for like deep learning of robot policy. So Isaac Sim and Muchoko are other simulation engines that people are using right now for 
you know, training robots in simulation, especially for things like manipulation. So I think historically people thought you can't really simulate robot manipulation, but these days simulators have gotten really good and they can simulate really accurately. And so you can see that there's this project like Robo Pianist where they actually have two shadow hand robots and then they're typing in or, or doing whatever you call it when people play piano, that the term, uh, I mean, you can kind of see what, they, what it's doing here. And what they hope to do is train a robot pianist in simulation and then transfer it to a real. Uh, yeah, and yeah, Mujoko is backed by Google now. Isaac Sim is backed by NVIDIA. So those are, it's usually a good sign that it's backed by a company because then they can put in engineers to improve it. And that's all I have for this tutorial. If you want to learn more, you can look at the slide and the links in there. And then there's also prior edition that I built this upon, although I modified it to include like my own preferences. Question. Hmm. All right. Well, I, I thought, uh, yeah, yeah. Question? Uh, which, so you're asking which simulators are in the Ubuntu operating system that we gave you. Uh, I don't think we've installed anything for you. Um, do you want to correct me, Shihan? Like, I don't think we installed any simulator for you. Um, All right, so, all right, so we're going to move on to the lecture for the topic for today. Uh, we are approaching the halfway point, so let's take like a five or six minute break for now, and then we'll, move, we'll come back and then we'll go over Bayesian network. So. All Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So one more minute. All right, I think we should get started. Um, um, all right, so hope everyone had a nice break. So for the second half of today, we're going to be talking about Bayesian networks. And so this is this is actually a pretty deep subject. So we have a little bit about Bayesian network today, and then more again on Wednesday. So let's get started. So we are going to be talking about probabilistic models. So that's why we had the probability review last class to make sure that we're more prepared for today. So we're in this business of making models. So model will describe how a portion of the world works, but there will always be, of course, some simplification. So in many of the things that I'll talk about now and later in the course, we will often assume, you know, we will have the random variable, the system operates like such and such, but we're often ignoring many details. So model may not account for every variable. In fact, they, I argue they usually don't. And they don't account for all interaction between the variables. So that's why you have this famous 
quote, and I'm sure most of you have seen this quote before from George Box about model being wrong, but some of them are useful. And so when we have probabilistic model, then this lets our agent do stuff like reasoning about unknown variables, given evidence. So we'll have a bunch of variables. We are given some of them, and then we have to make an inference. Like, what is the value of this set of random variables, given some that we know or are given? And we can do things like explanation, prediction, value of information. So if you, I mean, you do this all the time. So if you see or have evidence that someone is feeling sick, then you might have some diagnostic, like you might think about you know, what could cause that. And then given symptoms from someone, then you can try to make an inference, like what is the probability that they have this symptom that could have caused it. So yeah, so just remember that for today, we are talking about probabilistic model. There we will make assumption. If you disagree with the assumption here, that is up to you. You're, it's okay to disagree with the way that we design the interaction between the random variables that we'll talk about. As long as you're consistent in like how you design them and mathematically you know, analyze them. So yeah, uh, just to review, so two variables are independent. If this whole two, so probability of their joint can be factored as the probability of their individual quantity. And so you'll, you'll sometimes see x perpendicular y, and that means x is independent of y. And when you claim that two random variables are independent in your model, then yeah, you're making some kind of assumption. You're making a modeling assumption. So for example, if you have random variables and you're building a model that consists of like the weather, like what is the status of the weather? What's the status of traffic? What's the status of your uh, cavity and toothache? So if you imagine that these are binary random variables, then if you're building a model, then it seems like stuff like maybe weather and cavity, maybe they seem independent, like they don't really seem correlated in some way. But if you have like weather and traffic, they seem like they're correlated in some way. Like if you have bad weather, maybe the traffic is also bad. I mean, I assume if the weather is bad, like maybe like it is today, then you have the traffic is backed up because cars are going slowly and stuff like that. Yeah. So again, when you're, yeah, so one thing that to note is that if you have a joint distribution and you try to empirically get the numbers for it, you'll find that usually the best you'll get is like close to being independent, but not really independent. So saying two variables are independent is a very strong assumption. So let's look at some examples. P1 is just some kind of joint distribution over T and W. So let's say T is temperature and W is the weather. And the way to read the table is that if the temperature is hot and the weather is sunny, then the probability of that happening is there's this. So again, we make the assumption that you know, they can only take on two states and that we assume you know, we're given the probability distribution. Now, if you marginalize it, then you'll be able to deduce the probability of the temperature and the probability of the weather. Uh, everyone see how you get to, to these two tables from the first one. Uh, so it's like straightforward you know, marginalization of the random variable. So, so one question is, if you're given this, are T and W independent? I'll give you a second to think about it. And if you want, you can think about stuff like this. So think about it. Are, are T and W independent? Hmm. 
Everyone got it? All right, no one in the Google Doc. Uh, Uh, yeah, so the question is, given P1, are T and W independent or not? So if you, if you look at the probability that the temperature is hot, given that the weather is sunny, you look at that, those entries in the table. You have hot and then you have sun. It's 0.4. If you factorize it, probability of T being hot times probability of T being sunny, you get hot, which is 0.5, and sunny, which is 0.6. And you multiply them, you get 0.3. So 0.3 is not the same as, as 0.4. So they're not independent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, all right, so your question is to check for independent, do you have to check every combination or just one of them? So the answer is just one of them. If you find any of any of these examples where this failed, then they're not independent. Uh, so if you go back to the definition, yeah, for if for all x, y, this thing has to be equal to that. So if you find any counterexample, it's not independent. Yeah. But is any random one guaranteed to fit this? Like what if we went through the table? all of them checked out except the last one. Would we then, like, is it possible that some combinations would fit this, even though there are other ones that would fail the test? Uh, if, again, if you're talking about whether two random variables are independent, they only, it only you have to have this condition. For every combination, this has to be true. If anyone is not true, they're not they're considered independent. All right, what about P2? So if I ask you, are T and W independent, assuming they follow the joint in P2? I mean, so and you can kind of guess, like if, if I gave you P1 and I said they're not independent, but I give you P2, it's more likely that they're independent because I, I show something different. But if you do the math, then you can verify for, all the entries in the table. Yeah, so for example, T equals hot, W equals sun. That's 0.3. That is the same as 0.5 times 0.6. That's 0.3. You, you do this for all them, and then you know they're independent. Yeah, like cold and rain, 0.2 is cold, and then rain, and then you know, 0.4 divided by 2 is 0.2. And so we'll be reading from some of the tables. So just make sure that you're comfortable with like reading the, what what the tables mean. All right. So imagine that we have this this robot with multiple alarms that does a lot of coin flips. And if we have n fair independent coin flips then with x1 all the way to xn representing the n different on then it probably reasonable to have the table where the probability that x1 is head the 0.5 same thing for x2 and xn now one thing one one thing to realize about independence is that independence is a very is a simplifying assumption that helps to like lower the complexity of the probability table that we need to represent the distribution. If you have the joint of all this, then you need a table of two to the n to express all those probabilities. So does everyone see why this is true? Like what I'm writing here is that this first row 
is the joint probability that all of the variables turn out to be head. The second row is the joint that the joint probability that all the random variables are heads except for the last one. And yeah, if you if you go through the combination, it's like a table of two to the n, and then each probability is one over two to the n. Uh, because they're all like each of these has a unit of the same probability of a coin. So if you try to encode a table, then with with no assumption, then you have to have a table of this size. If you make the independent uh, independent assumption, then you can simplify the number of things that you have to store. And in fact, they're identically distributed. If, if you make the assumption that they're identically distributed, you only need to store like one of these. All right, conditional independence. So we, we talk about independence. In practice, independence is very hard to get, but conditional independence is intuitively feels like a weaker assumption, but might be more commonly, might be more common in your data. So here's an example. We have three random variables. Toothache, whether or not you have a toothache, whether or not you have a cavity, and whether or not this dentist robot catches a hole in your teeth. So I think I think if you have a cavity, it, it's more likely that it you know it catches like a hole because uh, I think that's what cavities do. Uh, so if you study the joint, if you think about it, we won't make a modeling assumption here that if you have a cavity, the probability that the probe catches in it doesn't seem to depend on whether you have a toothache or not. You can try to formalize this intuition like this. Probability that it catches something conditioned on that you have a toothache and that you have a cavity is the same as probability that you that it catches something given your cap uh, the cavity. So conditioned on cavity, the toothache add no more information. Again, this is a this is a modeling assumption. If you really if you disagree with this, that's your choice. You should build your own model that does something different. But we're gonna assume that here. And we're also going to assume that the same independence goes if you don't have a cavity. So the intuition here is that like the the cavity explained everything that you need to know about whether it catches like a hole or not. So normally, catch and toothache they don't seem like they're independent because they both indicate some problem with teeth, and those could have a lot of correlation. But conditioned on something you, that might explain everything. So. What we'll assume here is that catch is conditionally independent of toothache given the cavity. And you can write that as many different ways. I mean, I like thinking of it this way, like the probability of toothache and catch given cavity, you can split it up with these two. Uh, but you know, all these are equivalent ways of expressing conditional independent assumption. Yeah, uh, any questions on this? So again, let's think of some more examples. So what do you think might be conditionally independent here? Like if you have these three random variables, whether or not there's traffic, whether or not there are people are wearing umbrellas or like that's a robot in this case, and the whether or not it's raining. And so if you have three random variables, what, what do you think could be, you know, this is conditionally independent of this given the third thing? Uh, yeah, anyone? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, what are uh, what are what is conditionally independent here? Oh, so I'm look, I'm looking for a statement of this random variable is conditionally independent of this random variable given this random variable. Yeah. Probability of umbrella. No, no, no probability here. No probability. Training given umbrella. So, so this is what I'm looking for. Traffic and umbrella might be conditionally independent given that it's raining. So normally, if you don't know anything about raining and you ignore it, then traffic and umbrella, they seem like they're correlated in, in, in some sense. But if you condition it on raining, then it feels like that could explain all the correlation there. Okay, you may strongly disagree with this. If you do, that is your choice. You should build a model that expresses your own beliefs here. But here we're going to make the assumption that you know, here, you know, raining might explain everything that you need to know about the independence between traffic and umbrella. All right. And then the domain of fire, whether or not there's a fire whether or not there's a smoke or whether or not there's an alarm. So fire and alarm, should they be independent? What happens if they're independent? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, the alarm is useless. But if we make the assumption that, you know, Alarm and fire are conditionally independent given the smoke, then maybe you know the smoke explains the independence among those two. Or in other words, like probability of you know, alarm given that there is fire and the smoke, you know, the fire might not add in any extra information given that you already know that there's smoke. Yeah. Again, you, you might really disagree with this. You might think you should model some other random variables. Again, that's your choice. You should build a model that expresses your, your own belief when you try to model the world. Like maybe you, you actually have something like this where which, no, I guess it blocks the smoke uh, and then you might have a different model. So again, just, it'll be up to you on how you want to model your scenario. So why do we like why do we like conditional independence? Everyone here, I think, is familiar with the chain rule, which says if you have probability of x one all the way to x n, then you can factorize it like this. But when you do this, you have to be able to you go through all the variables like x one, x two, x three, and then you condition on every other preceding variable. So this is the decomposition when you just go with the normal chain rule. With the assumption of conditional independence, then you might get, uh, what, what do you think goes here? So can you say that again? Umbrella. I'm looking for, I guess I'm looking for a decomposition. Like there, there should be three terms here. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so if you assume that. Umbrella and traffic are conditionally independent. I think that's what we assumed earlier. Yeah, the traffic and umbrella are conditionally independent given that it's raining, then you can assume that given that it's raining, you just get rid of traffic, gives you no extra information. So, 
And the real advantage of Bayesian network, which is what we will cover next, is that they help us formalize this way of expressing conditional independence, like it gives us a way of rigorously characterizing the assumption here. All right, here's another example of conditional independence, just to give another exercise. So we have Ghostbusters. So I, I think with Ghostbusters, the person, the you have an agent that controls some flashlight, and then if you catch a ghost, then it succeeds or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think that's what Ghostbusters mean. But from a mathematical view, what this is showing is that there's two sensors that show two different positions where the ghost might be. Each sensor depends only on where the ghost is. So the two sensors are conditionally independent given the ghost position. Uh, so you know, that's an assumption, that's a modeling assumption that we're making here. So again, you, you might think, what about if there are other on model correlation? And again, you might, you should build a model that you think represents your belief, but here we're gonna assume that the two sensors are conditionally independent given the ghost position. So if you know that the ghost is in one spot, then you don't need a condition on the other sensor. It doesn't provide any extra information given the ghost. Uh, because the ghost gives you all you need to know about whether there's a sensor, your current sensor is going to read it or not. So it, let's assume that we're given the probability. To decompose this, we can decompose it like P of this joint, and then using the conditional independence, independence assumption, we can factorize it like this. Uh, so let's do some exercise here. So what is the probability that T, B, and G are all like positive? So in other words, what is P of plus T plus B plus G? Oh, given this. I'll give you some time to think about it. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, okay, so two people got it in the Google Doc at least, so the probability is 0.16, right? So that's how you get all the, you just look up all the numbers here, then you get 0.16. Uh, hopefully everyone knows how to get valued like the bottom row here where everything is negative, like then you have to look at P of negative G, which is 0 0.5, and then here you have to do a, sub a one minus this thing because you're, you're assuming a negative G and then you have a plus T, then you, if the probability of P of minus T given minus G is gonna be one minus the quantity. And then similarly for B is one minus the quantity. Uh, then you you you'll get the values here. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's talk about Bayesian networks. So otherwise referred to as graphical models. So Bayesian nets help us express conditional independence assumption. So they are a set of variables which are represented as nodes. So, uh, they don't usually look like this cartoon, but just, just think of it as, as 
representing that. You, you'll see more common examples after this. So you have a bunch of nodes, and then you have arc that connect them. Uh, then arc and code conditional independent. And each variable is conditionally independent of its non-descendant given the parent. Yeah. And the real advantage of Bayesian is that they they give us a tool for modeling and analyzing complex probability distribution by letting us use the machinery of conditional independence to uh, simplify the analysis and do stuff like perform inference. You know, what is the probability of this thing given that? All right, n independent coin flip. So we have our robot that's flipping a bunch of coins independently. What the what should the base net look like? Yeah, well, what do you think the base net should look like? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not familiar, so I'm just gonna like do what and do what I guess. I think it should be the standalone nodes with no connections because, as you said, like non descendants imply independence. So I would assume that the nodes are not connected. So non-connected nodes, right? Uh, okay, so no interaction between variables. This is the base net. Uh, I guess there should be uh, ellipses because you have a bunch of hidden ones, but yeah, this is the base net. There's no arcs, so they're independent. So, or what we call absolutely independent. Uh, All right, what about car and Sean? So this is a, a base net that encodes many different variables, though it might encode age, uh, whether or not you're a good student. Uh, yeah, because good student means you, I think you get a lower car insurance, but at least I got that. Uh, hopefully most of you got that too. And then there's like things like your year's license and, and so on. And the way that you think of the coloring is that a lot of times when you look at base net, the color usually indicate you know, whether something is observed or not. So were you given or do you observe the thing? And then the other, the unobserved thing that you're trying to infer or try to compute the probability of something. So you can deduce things like what is the probability of an accident? And um, that's over here. And you can deduce things like, you know, yeah, probability of an accident. And then you can condition it on all the other variables and then simplify it by just only looking at the parent of accident, which uh, directly depends on like driving behavior and mileage and so on. Yeah. So I think people have used base net like this to, as a tool for making decisions. All right, so if you look at traffic, the variables are R that it rains and then T that there's traffic. So model one is independent, so you might think that R and T are independent. If you think that way, then this should be your base net. That's your assumption, that's your modeling assumption. You might disagree and say that they're actually dependent on each other, like rain might cause traffic. In that case, your base net should probably be this one. Again, that's a modeling assumption. It's up to you whether you want to use model one or model two. It seems like if, if it really is the case that rain might cause traffic, then it feels like an agent that uses model two might be better at operating in the world. Like if it assumed that it, follow the model that rain causes the traffic, it can use the assumption that, oh, maybe there's rain, maybe I should not go driving, or maybe I should go at a different time or whatever. Uh, so that's what we really mean by, you know, if, if it is better, uh, again, this is sort of like a judgment call. Like you, again, can claim that maybe they're not independent, maybe they are independent. If that's the case, then you would just have to justify it.
All right. So let's look at another Bayesian net. This is a model of the robot. And there's three random variables. Whether the battery is off, whether the light is off, and whether there's no motion. Uh, why do you think this might make sense? Like this is the structure of the baby net, but why did why did we do it like this instead of like put the arrows in other locations? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the light off and no motion are conditionally independent given the battery is off. Yeah, I well, I guess I I, I guess I was more looking, I think you're getting to the right thing. I, I guess I was more thinking about it, it seems like if the battery is off, then that causes the light to be off and or that causes uh, no motion to happen. So the intuition is that the arrows indicate some kind of cause and effect. So one of them causes the other. So they really encode conditional independence assumptions. Like you, they might not be causal, but usually in business, it's easier to build them if you make the assumption that they're causal. Uh, so that's why we did battery lead to no motion uh, instead of the other way around. Uh, but again, you, you might think, you know, the arrow should be in another direction for your own model. If that's the case, you, yeah, uh, you should argue why the arrow should be connected in a different way. Uh, yeah. But but here the intuition is that the battery is, is off, is going to like cause the light to be off and it's going to be causing there to be no motion. Uh, uh, so if we assume that the light is off, so we observe that the light is off. So that's what the shaded node means. It feels like the, the intuition is like this. And we're going to go into more formalism later, but this is mainly for more intuition. If the battery is off and the battery off causes the light to be off, then if we observe this, it seems like the battery off probability should increase, right? So it also seems like that the robot might not move as well. Like if the battery is off, probability goes up, then the probability that there's no motion also goes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the battery dependent on light? If if it is, I I think for, for this model, we're gonna assume that they're not. If you think they are, then you should build a different base net. Or or maybe include some extra node. Yeah. But we're gonna make the simple the assumption here that you no, know, like battery causes light or battery causes motion. Yeah. So in some sense, the information kind of propagates from one node to another. And we'll formalize how this works uh, next class. So now we're going to assume that there's a new uh, binary random variable, whether or not the wheel is damaged. So again, this is a modeling assumption that we make about how we're going to analyze our robot. So here we're just going to assume that it's important for us to know the status of the wheel damage. All right, we first observe no motion. So what happened to the probability of the battery off and the probability of the wheel damage? Uh, what do you think happened to, to, to the top two? I'll let you think of, uh, yeah. Uh, the probability increases, uh, do you think for both of them? Okay, so the if you observe no motion, then yeah, if you assume that both of both of the cause no motion, then yeah, the probability should go up. 
What about this? Light off. Up or down? Since the battery off is more likely, it's more likely that the light is off. All right, now we observe that the light is off. So if you observe that the light is off and that there is no motion, what happened to the probability of the battery off and the wheel damage? Do they go up or down or neither? Uh, yeah. So I think the battery being off, that should go up and the wheel damage should go down because the wheel damage doesn't affect the light. So you know the cause for the motion is more likely to that. Okay, so I think you explained it pretty well. So the battery off belief increases, uh, then the probability that the wheel is damaged decreases. Because if the battery off goes up, then it's likely that this explained what no motion. And uh, then the wheel damage goes down. And uh, therefore, we'll formalize this more in the next class. So if you, the technical term is explaining away. So if you have some explanation of this, that, no. I, don't, I, I guess they call it explaining away because if you know this, then you don't, it, it, this is less likely to have explained no motion. Uh, so hopefully that intuition kind of makes sense. Uh, any any other questions about this example? All right. So let's talk about bayes nuts. Like uh, more formally. So again, a set of nodes, one per variable, a directed acyclic graph. So there's no cycle. There is a conditional distribution for each node. So a collection of distribution over X for each combination of the parent value. Yeah. And you can think of Bayesian as like encoding causal processes, but again, the arrows really mean that they encode a conditional independent assumption instead of like A causes B. But it's easier to think and design a bait net if you assume the causal assumption. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Would it be more reasonable to have weighted graph? A uh, weighted graph for a bait net? Uh, what would the weights be? Are you think so? If you're talking about weight, I guess like if if x is like some discrete random variable that takes on ten values, uh, then I guess like what what would the weights be in that case? Yeah, like the way that the way that we we model these is that each node has its own conditional probability table. So for every combination of the parent value, that determines one distribution over all the possible value of X. And then any different combination of the parent is also another distribution over, uh, over the value of X. So, the, the, so what, what's really going on is that you know, each node has its own uh, conditional probability table. Yeah, so I, I think this is just the way that people have designed bait nets. And a bait net over a set of random variable indicates the joint distribution over it as a product of local conditional distribution. So the claim here is that probability of the joint is equal to the product of xi given the parent. 
So for example, if you have the cavity toothache and catch example, and if this is the base net, then you can decompose this prob probability into P of cavity because cavity has no parent, so it's just like it, you don't you don't need to condition on anything. Catch and toothache have cavity as the parent, so you only have to condition on them. Yeah. So you know again, the nice thing about bees now is that you know, when these graphs become much larger and larger, computing that full joint naively is very difficult. But if you look just at the conditional. If the number of parents is not too much, then you can analyze it just from a smaller set of conditional probability tables. Of course, your, your parents have, the number of parents has to be pretty small. Like if it's too big, then you get something like closer to a fully connected graph. And then the utility of the bait net is probably weaker uh, compared to if it had fewer parents. So again, the reason why setting this results in a proper joint distribution is that we have the chain rule, which is valid for all prob probability distribution. So this is always true. When we're assuming conditional independence, then for all i, the conditional probability going from one to x i minus one, we're gonna assume that everything before is apparent uh, or that all that is like a topological ordering. And then you got the parent here. And as a consequence, you get uh, this thing here, this thing at the full joint. So, Hopefully that's all clear about how to decompose a joint distribution. And oh yeah, the last point here is that yeah, not every base net can represent every joint distribution. So if you assume a model with A and B as with no connection between them, then you can only represent distribution where A and B are independent. So uh, the reason that you, if you are forced to, like the reason that if you, have A and B separate, then you are guaranteed that A and B are independent uh, based on the definition of the B net. Uh, so you can't like encode a distribution that has the dependence among the two. No. All right, any other, any questions about probability than B net? Uh, hopefully it's all clear like why this decomposition is really nice. All right, so going back to the example of the coin flip, and if you have something like this, where you have a bunch of independent random variables, then you can really, you can only represent distribution who, only distribution whose variables are absolutely independent can be represented with, with this base net. Uh, yeah, and, for example, with n equal four, you can compute probabilities like this by just decomposing the joint probab probability into the probability of the individual uh, distrib distribution. All right, so let's, if we go back to our traffic example, if we have, this as our base net, where this is the probability of it raining or not, and the probability that you have traffic given that it's raining. What is this value? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it.
All right, everyone got it? Hmm. No one typed in anything yet, uh, but I'll just give it to you. So. so probability of plus R because it's raining, and then you have the this other probability, like that if there's no traffic given that it's raining, which is this thing here. Yeah, so one fourth squared or one over 16. Another common base net that you'll see is one with the alarm network. So there's a burglary, whether there's a burglary or not, whether there's an earthquake or not, whether there's an alarm or not, other than whether your, your neighbor John called or Mary called. Uh, this was back in the day when people knew their neighbor. So, yeah. so maybe you're given these probabilities. You might be given this conditional probability table for the alarm. Now, one quick question. Um, how many total probability distribution are in the table? Uh, so in that table, how many valid probability distribution are there like shown here? Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully the question is a bit clearer, but if it's not, then it the number is four, right? Because for all possible combination of E and A. You fix those, and then you define a distribution over A that sum to one. So for the for plus E and plus A, we have, you know, I oh, sorry for sorry you have B and E. So B and E are both positive here. Then you have plus A and minus A, and then this sum to one. So that is one probability distribution. And then you get another one here. Or then another one here. And then your fourth probability distribution is over there. Yeah. So yeah. And so again, the nice thing that what I'm trying to show here is that these are examples of conditional probability tables. We're able to express the distribution over these five random variables using the the smaller table. Because otherwise, if you lump them all together, you would have a much bigger table to work with. So let's again take a look at the traffic example. What this is showing is a base net in the causal direction. So it goes from R to T. And if you look at the numbers, you can do the math and you'll get this joint probability distribution. Yeah. So like, I mean, if you want to look at the first one, like plus R is one fourth, plus R and plus T is three fourths, so three fourths, Time one fourth is three over sixteen. So. Now, now, this example, the point of this example is to show that base nets don't really need to be causal. So you could have traffic and rain. So you could have your arrow going from T to R, like that. And if you plug in the number. For this, like probability of T, probability of R given T, then you might get stuff that looks like this. And if you do the map and you work it out, you can get the same thing as this. So for example, with plus T is nine over 16, you know, multiply by one over third, the nine divided by three is three over 16. And this is the same as this. So we went from one distribution, one big net that went from R to T and then one from T to R. And they have the same 
joint probability. So what this is really showing is that you can have a bait net, which might not make sense. It might not be causal, but it's like a valid bait net. Like this is a set of valid probability distribution that you might get uh, from this. So yeah. So the reason why it be, when we teach Bayes net, we often think about causal, causal effect is that it seems easier for us to think about. Like if we go, if we see that A goes to B, it kind of feels more intuitive. And it's also very easy, easier to, to get from experts. So like you want to make, if you're, if you're trying to build a model and you have domain experts who are not experts in Bayes net, you really want to make it as easy as possible for them. So, yeah. So again, you might not, the Bayes net might not actually be causal, but in practice, it's better to have them be like that. The arrows really mean that they enforce certain conditional independent assumptions. That is to say, we have probability of xi conditioned on all this is equal to probability of xi given on the parent. So. Uh, yeah, any any questions on, on this? So, so again, I described the robot example in a causal manner just for the sake of intuition. Uh, so hopefully that's why we talk about causal, causality here. So to, to summarize, so we reviewed, uh, I, well, first we reviewed the end of lecture three, then we reviewed Python, NumPy, and Roth. Then we just reviewed BayesNet and how they encode a joint distribution and the role of conditional independent assumption. On Wednesday, we'll cover more about Bayesian networks. And then next week, Monday, we'll cover state estimation method that use Bayes net as part of their assumption. Uh, so that's it for today. I'll see you on Wednesday. So I have office hours uh, right now. If you have a very quick question, I can talk otherwise for something longer. Let's uh, walk over. Uh, hopefully it just stopped raining. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell from, from here. Uh, yeah. I have a very quick question. Yes. Can we get any kind of like, um, or maybe they already exists like a calendar for when the Tuesday lab section? Uh, yeah, I think I see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, I'll try to get them. Okay.